Hi, and welcome to the second webinar on one of the CFP Board's major strategic initiatives, the Client Impact Research Study. Hello, I am Kevin Roth, Managing Director of Research here at CFP Board. I'm excited to introduce today's webinar, where we'll get an update on this ambitious research study that will, over the next decade, look at the impact holistic financial planning has on clients and society more broadly. During today's webinar, we will learn about the research team's progress, including the consumer financial wellness definition and framework that they're developing to evaluate client outcomes. And they will also share some, share some takeaways from the second round of pilot surveys conducted earlier this year. But before we hear from the research team, please welcome Kevin Keller, CEO of CFP Board, who has some opening remarks. Kevin? Dr. Kevin Ross, thank you so much. And thank you all for joining us today to learn more about this effort. Uh, we at CFP Board are, are excited about the research. You know, for years we've had Vanguard's Alpha Survey. We've had the Morningstar Gamma research. And this will be the financial planning Delta survey, so to speak. You know, there are still some letters of the Greek alphabet that are left. We're looking at the difference in this research, the outcomes and well being of Americans who work with CFP professional versus those who work with non certified financial advisors and DIYers. The survey will follow and measure financial conditions and progress toward financial well being at least over the next 10 years. The Board of Directors is committed to a, a multi-year longitudinal study. The research, as I said, is a major component of our strategic plan. It supports CFP Board's mission to advance the financial planning profession for the benefit of the public. And it's building a body of knowledge for the profession as well. Our research is also getting strong media attention, which helps us raise awareness of CFP certification and financial planning more generally. The Client Impact Survey is our most ambitious research project to date. Last year, as you, many of you know, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of CFP celebration, of CFP certification rather, and last month, we crossed 100,000 active CFP professionals. There's no doubt about it that the financial planning profession is on the ascent. And a strong academic community and rigorous, robust research are central to the profession's growth and development. We're grateful for our strong relationships with the academic community. I'd like to extend a special thanks to the research team who are here with us today to share more with you about this important work. And so now I'll turn it back over to CFP Board's Managing Director of Research, Dr. Kevin Roth. Back to you, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin, for your remarks and for your support of this initiative. I hope everyone finds today's conversation engaging, and I encourage you to share feedback on what you hear. While we have disabled the live chat, you should you can share your questions and comments by clicking on the Q&A button at the very bottom of the screen. Time permitting, the researchers will address your questions following their presentation. And with that, let me turn the floor over to the research team. Let's start with Dr. Stuart Heckman. Stu? Hi, thank you, Kevin, and thank you both for a great introduction to this study. We're really excited to be here today and share some updates with you. So my name is Stu Heckman. I'm an associate professor of practice at Texas Tech University, and I serve as the PhD program director of the personal financial planning program there. Thanks, Stuart. I'm uh, Michael Collins. I'm a professor at the University of Wisconsin, and I study household financial decision making with a focus on issues like retirement and disability. Um, I'm kind of the new kid to the team, so thank you for having me. Hi, everyone. My name is Emily Kushel. I am the manager of financial wellness at eMoney and also serve as adjunct faculty at NYU in their master's program for financial planning. Good afternoon. I am Sonia Luter, professor at Texas Tech University, specializing in financial health and wellness and also a consultant in the psychology of financial planning space. 
So Michael is new, but he's been an excellent addition since our first update on the progress that we've made. Just to give you a brief recap of some of that work that happened over the course of last fall and into the winter months, we collected a pilot study early on and our major goal with that was to look at some of these measures and ultimately we want to look at measures that evaluate the financial planning outcomes of a diverse and representative sample but this is not just of cfp professionally advised households we also want to look at people who are using other types of financial professionals so that we can really see some of those changes in the outcomes that we might like to see between clients of any sort and the do-it-yourself household and then breaking that further into the CFP professionals and non-CFP professionally advised households. This is not a one-year project, as Kevin Keller has reminded us. This is a 10-year or more project, very longitudinal in nature, looking at those changes over time and what it looks like for people to come in and out of some of these various samples, what it looks like when their family dynamics change, et cetera. And as you can imagine, there are a number of design issues associated with this that we discussed at our first webinar update that we have some solutions for and still working through some of the other issues. Uh, some of the issues that we have generally been able to resolve since the last time we met are the selection issues of who decides to use professional advice and why. And looking at some of these outcomes in a way that is objective and also allowing for that subjective nature to come in as well. So in today's um, session, we will review a little bit of the pilot one data process, and then we're going to primarily get into the pilot two data results. As a reminder of what the ultimate outcome is, we want to look at the this idea of financial financial wellness, which is a combination of not only being good or being healthy, but also feeling good about one situation. So that element of happiness and contentment, uh, one of the elements that really was pulled out from the first webinar, which was great, uh, the pilot one data, again, pilot, so not the diverse and representative sample that we ultimately would like. But what we did see is there are some measurable differences in that happiness and relationship happiness between these groups that we're looking at. We also want to look at participants' issues of feeling in control of their situation, so that financial confidence and ability to take action on their own. Combined what this looks like is financial wellness is the acting, thinking, and feeling content and fulfilled with one's financial situation that comes together with this framework that looks a lot like cognitive behavioral therapy, if that's a model that you are familiar with. And within this model, we do have the standard measures of well-being that you've probably seen in other work, particularly um, some of the larger data bases look at financial well-being from the resource management perspective, very heavy there with how well is a person managing their financial situation, debt, savings, investments. But we also want to capture, do they feel good about that? And um, are they happy? So that's that financial well-being element. And then also, how do they think about their financial situation the psychosocial condition. And with this one, you'll see some words that mimic the psychology of financial planning definition, looking at the study of the mind and relationships as they pertain to those other two elements. So within this framework, you'll see that any one of these can affect the other one. If a person has is really good on resource management, they are making ends meet, they don't have any debt, they look really good objectively, There's, they still might not have a high financial wellness score because they don't feel satisfied with where they are currently. They're still chasing something else. So with 
in this, we did um, have that pilot one data. We have some pilot two data, but ultimately we do have a framework for the target population we want to look at. And this is a population that's probably gonna look familiar to you from other work that the CFP board has done. So I will hand it over to Dr. Heckman to give us a brief rundown of what that target population is. Yeah, thanks. So this, um... And as Sonia mentioned, this is kind of in flux. Um, this is a conversation that we've been having. This is the target population that we're aiming for currently. But some of the things that we're talking about within this, you know, being a 10 year study, um, we've decided to kind of lower our thresholds, um, I'd say, relative to what is typically thought of as the um, typical client that a CFP professional would be engaging with. Because over a 10-year period, we might see people kind of moving in and out of this um, target population. And those are really important opportunities from a research perspective to try to identify the effect of working with a planner, um, engaging services for the first time, moving away from services. And so those movements will be really important. And so um, this is especially something uh, that we're gathering feedback around. So if you have thoughts about what kind of target population um, you would like to see, you know, we'd, we'd be uh, happy to have uh, those suggestions. And so just a reminder, the pilot one results, um, there is a recorded webinar from our, our first discussion. Um, and primarily this, uh, the first round of pilot data, we were really interested in testing the outcomes, the financial wellness framework and getting measures um, solidified around that. And then as a result of that first webinar, we did have a number of great um, points of feedback. And you can see some of the uh, summary points here. And I'll, I think I wanna highlight just that participants really added a lot of useful and diverse perspectives on what they would like to see um, you know, out, of the, out of the study in the long run. Um, a few of the highlights, I think, one thing that I'm particularly excited about would be this longitudinal nature and the ability to track things over time and see how things change within the profession over the next 10 years, uh, while also accounting for, you know, we'll have state identifiers as the plan so that we'll be able to, you know, as regula uh, regulatory action, um, you know, changes between states, those are also really good research opportunities to try to identify the impact of uh, those types of changes. But in general, I think I'll also just point out there's a lot of excitement for for the study and um, and obviously we share in that and we're glad the board shares in that. Um, and so we're really excited to uh, see this project come together. So just to give a quick summary of our approach here on pilot two. So our, our real objective was really focused on continue to test the um, the measurement, the items that we're using, the financial framework, uh, financial wellness framework, and to continue to clarify some of the selection issues. And so what we mean by that um, would be the, the ways in which people sort into or choose to work with um, financial professionals. And then one of the real keys that we were focused on in pilot two was this aspect of um, how do we account for differences in service options when somebody consults with a financial professional? There was actually a, a, a question that I saw came the, come through the chat about DIY households and how we're going to define that. And one of the important features here is we really need to be able to capture what types of engagements and services people are getting when they go to see a CFP professional, because we know there's a lot of variation within that, and when they go see a non-CFP professional. Um, and so a lot of the measures, and we're going to highlight a couple of those today, uh, we're really focused on trying to clarify what the services are so that we can make reasonable comparisons. And so in pilot two, we really had two samples that we're going to talk about. We had a financial professional sample, which included CFP professionals that came out of the CFP board panel, and then also a broader database of financial advisors who are not CFP professionals. And so we'll, um, we'll highlight a few differences here. But again, I really want to emphasize, you know, our, our results today based on these sample sizes and, you know, people have selected into participation with, with these surveys. It's a lot different than the sampling that we're going to be going through with our research partner um, on the collection in the first round for the 10-year study, um, where that data is going to be representative. We really want to 
de-emphasize you no know, differences at this point in time. Uh, so I'd caution not to draw you no know, inferences or conclusions about differences between groups. The real focus here is on items and how we're uh, wording the questions and what we're hoping to measure uh, with these different items. And then we also had a, a second round um, that we sent to clients and consumers using an all-comer panel, and you can see some minimum asset size um, and income there. And with that, I will turn it over to Michael, who will walk us through the financial professional sample. All right. Thanks, Stu. Well, I, you know, I want to emphasize we're you know we're not trying to say anything generally about the field, but we are given a real nice opportunity here to compare how different groups of professionals answer different kinds of questions and also how that compares to how clients answer those same questions. So um, this is all exploratory, but it helps us to get a sense of how this survey will work. Um, and so what I'm gonna do is walk through some of those preliminary results from this sample that Stuart just talked about. Um, so the first thing I wanted to show is a map. We got a, res a response from a financial professional in 40 out of 50 states. Um, you can see the darker states like California, Texas, and Florida, we tended to get more responses from. No surprise, those are some of our bigger states. Um, so again, this is not nationally representative per se, but it does give us a sense of a, a pretty diverse group of professionals across the country. So on the next slide, this is just a little bit about the uh, profile of the advisors. And so again, advisors, we're defining here as uh, financial professionals who work with clients, but do not report having that CFP professional designation. That is in contrast to the CFP professionals who did say, in addition to whatever other uh, credentials they might have, they do acknowledge having that CFP uh, professional. So um, in general, this was an old, older sample that we're surveying here. Um, and the majority are 55 and older. I think only about 20% were under 40. So it tended to be a little bit older of a sample, it tended to be more male, um, more women in the uh, CFP professional side. But um, you know, in general, this is probably representative of what we, what we might see in the field more broadly. Um, about half had an advanced degree of some kind, so post-college degree. Um, the majority were white, um, between three quarters and four fifths were white. Um, and then in terms of their own investable assets, we wanted to see um, if we get responses from advisors in this and advisors and, and CFP professionals, and we did. Um, and about a third uh, reported they themselves having at least a million dollars in investable assets. All right, so the next uh, question we wanted to explore a little bit was uh, what other credentials that uh, particularly the CFP professionals held? Um, and my main takeaway from this is this is a really diverse field. People have a lot of different backgrounds they're bringing. Um, and so for us, when we talk about generalizing about whether it's advisors or CFP professionals, we have to keep in mind that there's uh, a lot of layers here, a lot of different combinations of characteristics and backgrounds um, of the professionals in this field. MBA was the most common, but that was only one in five. Um, and you can see the, the other designations, you know, running all the way down to a JD, a law degree. Um, so um, our main takeaway is as we start to think about our research project um, and how we recruit and how we ask questions of the advisors in the panel, uh, we're gonna have to keep, keep mindful of these other designations and how we define them and, um, you know, what those other uh, components might add to that client relationship. All right, in the next slide, uh, this is where we start to do some comparisons that I think are interesting from our perspective as we are designing this 10-year longitudinal study, where we can look at the results for questions from clients. The questions, so clients are people who are working with a financial professional, they're not DIY, um, and then advisors and then CFP professionals. And so these questions are sort of built around um, a seven point scale. So the seven point scale is basically how um, deep or how uh, rich that the planner and the client talk about their work on um, the principal knowledge topics from the CFP board. So estate planning, psychology of financial planning, tax planning, risk and insurance planning, investment planning, and then retirement savings and income planning. Um, so a few takeaways I can share with this. I know it's a busy slide, but, you know, in general, the clients and the advisors and professionals had pretty similar trends. I mean, whether it was a, around, um, you know, retirement and, and income, retirement savings and income planning tended to be quite high, just like investment planning. That's kind of what we'd expect. That's a, a primary driver of that relationship. 
Um, you know, we see lower responses on things like estate planning, um, which again, we might kind of predict because it tends to be, um, you know, an area that may not be as much a focus. Um, it is interesting that clients tend to see a lot more depth in their uh, content around estate planning than um, the particularly the non CFP advisors. Uh, but in general, I think what we see here is, is, you know, general agreement on, and again, these aren't, these are not matched pairs. So these are not clients with their actual professionals. These are just averages within the populations. Um, but we are seeing that, that um, both the uh, professionals and the clients are viewing the depth around these areas in pretty consistent ways. Um, you know, I think we're, not too surprised that uh, we see investment and retirement savings as being really high. Those are, again, primary drivers. Um, but then things like tax planning, which, um, you know, we see a little bit more divergence, probably from a client's perspective, that's something that they're very focused on, although it may not be a, a focus of every session the same way uh, maybe retirement savings or income planning is. So, um, again, as we generalize about the relationship between planners, uh, advisors, and professionals, and the client it, it, it is another um, you know, reminder for us to be cautious about characterizing how these relationships occur, what topics are covered uh, in each session, um, and really the fact that clients are going to have diverse needs. And so there's going to be different kinds of relationships for different kinds of advisors. The next slide. Um, so this is where we asked the CFP professionals and the advisors um, about their relationship with their clients. Um, and when, and again, we had a scale. And so here we're just looking at the responses when the professional or the advisor said, that describes me completely. And so the kinds of things where they said, um, you know, these, these particular aspects describe them completely are that they link their recommendations to their client goals, that they work interactively with clients, um, and they spend time learning about their client's anxiety and stress. So those tend to be um, higher range items. It's also interesting that the CFP professionals tended to score a quite a bit higher uh, than the advisors in a couple of categories, including uh, looking at the client's personal goals and then working interactively. So perhaps a sign that there's a you know, different sort of relationship uh, between clients of CFP professionals versus clients of non-CFP professionals. Um, you know, across the board, we, we saw you know, at least a third of advisors and uh, even a larger share of CFP professionals saying that they, uh, you know, these these aspects describe them completely, including things about learning about their spouse partner relationship or learning about family history and family values. So, again, there's a lot of activities that in, that professionals are engaged with with clients, um, and you know, we we didn't see very many professionals saying, "No, this doesn't describe me at all. I don't." Uh, you know, I don't try to learn about financial anxiety and stress. So um, I think these questions worked fairly well for us. And it'll be interesting when we can start to compare this to the client side as well, which we weren't able to do this one. But in the future, we'll be able to see if the client perceptions of uh, their, uh, particularly their advisor, it matches what their actual perceptions are. And next slide. Hey, thanks, Michael. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get into the client and the consumer sample. So starting with a very similar slide to what you would have seen uh, from Michael is the states. And so, of course, darker is going to represent uh, greater proportions that were sampled there. Uh, here in the client and consumer sample, we have about 28 states represented. Uh, getting up into the results, though, of what we have. So Using that target population that Dr. Heckman had reviewed as we started out the conversation, this chart is going to compare our consumer sample with that of the client sample. Um, and as Dr. Collins mentioned, this is going to be those, when we say clients, those that are working with financial professionals. Uh, so of those that are clients, 63% were male, and that's going to be compared to 51% were not working with a financial professional. Uh, the client sample also tended to look a bit older. Uh, they were more likely to have a college degree and be employed full time. Uh, about 73% of that client sample actually had a bachelor's degree or higher. Uh, and that's going to be compared to 52% in the consumer sample. So the client sample, in addition to uh, those items, were also more likely to have a partner um, and have higher income and higher investable assets. Uh, something else that I want to touch on that isn't actually shown on that particular slide, 
Of those who started working with a professional, uh, 48%, so nearly half the clients, reported that they started working with a financial professional due to referrals from friends and families. And given that this is a pretty notable area of influence for seeking a financial professional, uh, we'll also plan to continue exploring additional factors that may be influencing seeking and then even hiring a financial professional, such as some of the personal characteristics that they may be looking for, designations and education, uh, even looking at things like location or accessibility. So uh, service offerings, you know, in-person or virtual service offerings, all of which may be influencing um, or providing barriers to working with that financial professional. Um, so here, uh, as Dr. Luder had actually mentioned in our framework, when we're looking at well-being, uh, well-being has a psychological and a social condition. And a part of that is actually going to be perceptions. And perceptions can be really powerful, especially as an indicator of well-being. This generally can tell us how people perceive their lives are going. So perceived well-being, uh, kind of interestingly enough, has been uh, seen as a, a key predictor in overall uh, well-being, and that's that's beyond some of the objective measures that we may be more familiar with. So, in order to just get a, a sense of this perception, we had uh, we asked participants, you know, uh, to consider their financial situation and then select words that described their feelings about it. This is kind of interesting. You know, as we would expect, uh, those who are working with a financial professional, they expressed more favorable sentiments. Uh, and some of these are gonna be what we would generally expect as a result of the financial planning experience. So uh, for example, a sense of being successful, feeling prepared, secured, even, even disciplined as one of those. Uh, but this is kind of the interesting part is beyond those uh, were perceptions of, competency and confidence, even using words like excited. So if we look at confidence and excitement, we actually see that these are almost double compared to those that aren't working with a financial professional, which is really interesting because this starts to at least underscore the value or the perceived value of working with a financial professional um, that are coming through in these expressed sentiments of the clients. So, this is really notable. Um, as we move forward to the next slide, uh, we'll look at actually how uh, professionals or how clients communicate with their professionals. So um, clients working with a financial professional reported how often and in what form they actually communicate with that professional. So perhaps really not that surprising, um, some of these results. We see that email was by far the most frequent form of communication with 69% reporting very frequently or often. And that's gonna be followed by phone and in-person meetings, which again, uh, generally we would expect these, but perhaps something that is a bit newer here is the web platform-based messaging with 33% reporting very frequently or often. Uh, followed by that, we have video and text messages, which are somewhere in between uh, with our sometimes or, or rarely there. And then social media was the least used with 62% reporting that uh, it was never. But while it's important that uh, we understand how clients are communicating currently and today, we're also really interested in understanding how this could either, either stay the same or change in the future. So for example, if we look at email, phone, and in-person meetings, these, these are what we have traditionally used as forms of communication. Uh, but of course, if we just go back you know, a couple of years here, we're coming off the heels of the pandemic, which forced us to adapt to virtual offerings. If we look at the evolution of financial technology, we may continue to see even more innovative ways to communicate. So, as we're looking at this today, it's very interesting, but we'll also look to continue assessing this and um, understand what is being used most frequently in the coming years. And then also asking clients about their preference for communication. So this can help us really better understand that although this is what they're using it, what is the client's preference and start to get at perhaps what is the most effective client communication. So more to come as we 
move forward with these results. All right. Um, so in addition to understanding how clients are communicating with their financial professionals, we also want to understand if they're using any other resources or turning to any other resources. And in particular, we ask them to reference um, what are they relying on to inform their financial or investment decisions. So starting with, with our clients, again, those working with our financial professionals, they were more likely to use tools provided by their employer and tools of that of the financial firm, which makes good sense. Um, while both the, the clients and the consumers show relatively low levels of use when it came to social media or online videos, uh, this is again something that we'll wanna look at because um, this could continue to change over the years as we see uh, especially more active social media and video use from that of, of younger generations. So this area could be particularly interesting uh, to track as somebody may move from being, let's say a consumer into a client and we have the time in this longitudinal study to understand some of those resources. Uh, in addition to that, we actually have both groups that are actively searching um, through uh, some formal channels, but also using what we probably all have turned to at some point in time, which is just the general internet, so Googling. And then in addition to that, as we're looking at some of these digital resources, one thing that um, is noted to add to this list uh, as an additional category is uh, AI. So something like a chat GPT and using that as a digital resources. Um, in addition to that, kind of finally wrapping up this portion here is also assessing how important these resources are to those that are using them. And perhaps even more telling is to what degree they actually trust these resources. So additional considerations for, for the future. All right. Uh, and finally, we absolutely know that financial psychology is becoming a uh, really important. It is a crucial part of financial planning. We see that underscored, of course, with the emphasis that the CFP board has put on it. Financial planners are recognizing the need to consider client attitudes, their, their beliefs, and they're building these into the strategies and the advice that they're providing. And so we ask clients, you know, how well do these following statements, giving them a battery of statements, describe the conversation that you're having with the financial professional. So these are these are really kind of rich uh, results here. So the results really quite vividly illustrate that there is a positive perception from clients um, that they hold regarding the relationship with their financial professionals. So on the left-hand side, we'll see that clients consistently express higher levels of trust, of satisfaction. You'll see that um, generally underpinned with you know, confidence in their financial advisors. They're noting integrity and skills and expertise. And importantly, clients feel that the financial professional considers, generally speaking, all areas of their lives when they're developing the financial plan, which this aligns with the other results of seeing that uh, they feel like recommendations are aligning with their personal goals or personal needs you know, et cetera. But if we looked on the right-hand side, so our lowest frequency, this is gonna reveal some areas where financial professionals may need to enhance some of their strategies or just considerations. So notably, we'll see those that are related to additional aspects of personalization, as well as communication, so proactive communication. So clients um, for this lower frequency uh, indicated you know, their financial advisor making an effort to understand those personal values, priorities, but notably here, family history or, or family values. And this was going to provide that deeper, richer personalization. Uh, in addition to some of those, we see uh, regular contact from the advisor to discuss life changes affecting finances was also rated lower. But as we look at, again, some of these lower frequencies, there's still a silver lining in here. So clients are less open to considering to actually move away from their financial professional. 
So this is indicating at least some baseline of satisfaction. And again, just areas for us to look to of um, understanding, you know, what could we be doing and understanding the importance of these conversations. So overall, uh, very positive experiences, but considerations for us as we move forward and, and future considerations for professionals. All right, I think over to you, Jim. Um, and I think I just wanna highlight that this is just kind of a preview of some of the results. We have um, a number of items that were um, that were asked within both the advisor and on the client and consumer side. And we'll have a, a full written report published on the client impact website. So you can stay tuned for that. That really goes over, you know, each item that, that was on the survey. And so more to come there, but uh, we wanted to highlight here are some of the differences that we're seeing so far. These are some of the items that we're, that we're testing and that we're measuring. And so in terms of our next steps, um, we're excited to uh, announce that we have identified a research partner who's actually going to be collecting the data. So the research team, um, along with uh, Dr. Kevin Roth, uh, will be working really closely with uh, NORC at the University of Chicago. And you're probably, if you're around um, any of the research circles or um, are familiar with some of these large uh, nationally representative data sets, um, we have the NORC has a lot of experience collecting um, household finance um, data sets, including the survey consumer finances, the NLSY, and the um, general social survey. And so we're, we couldn't be more pleased to be working with them. And in terms of our next steps uh, with NORC, so we're going to be uh, doing another round of testing, finalizing the survey instrument. Um, obviously, we'll do some survey user experience and making sure just that all the programming is working correctly. But we're, we're getting more and more comfortable, uh, you know, with these items that we're asking about and the framework that the whole project is fitting into. We really think it's going to be unique data that really doesn't exist uh, currently, that we're going to have a, a really rich variety, both from the client and the consumer perspective, as well as the advisor perspective. Our current hope is that we'll be able to do our initial round of data collection sometime this summer. And one of the really exciting aspects about um, this opportunity is that, and I think uh, Michael mentioned it as we were going through just the basic comparisons on some of those items, we currently don't have any matched pairs where we have um, advisors and their clients responding to the survey. Well, this first year, we're gonna be thinking through what could a methodology uh, look like that would allow us to include some match pairs going forward. We think this would be an especially powerful um, method to gain insight into the planning relationship, the impact on consumers, and to really account for those service level differences and the differences in the types of engagements in order to really identify the, the differences that we're, we're most interested in. And then with that, I'll let Dr. Luter talk a little bit about um, some of the new survey topics we're considering. Yes, this is the funnest slide out of all of them in my opinion. So I'm glad that I get to introduce some of these ideas to you. And there have been some really good questions coming in in the Q&A, but I suspect you will have some questions or feedback on these items as well. So we're happy to address those as well. In pilot one, the whole purpose of that data was to test those outcome measures. So looking at the elements of wellness, which is not just well-being, how a person feels, but how they actually are doing objectively. And we discovered some potential issues with that that we were able to address and resolve within the pilot two data. And we're really excited to work with NORC with some of their advanced survey collection mechanisms to even get more precise data in that regard. Pilot two, we really looked at the selection issues and, and again, solidified some of those outcome measures a bit more. But during both of the pilot one and pilot two, we discovered some additional areas that we didn't have sufficient questions on. And of course, we can't have a survey that takes an hour to complete, but we think we can fit some of these items 
in and would love to hear your feedback or other ideas because this is a project that will benefit all of us. We really want to identify what it is that prompts clients to seek a financial professional. The longitudinal data is going to give us some more insight into this. Was it a death in the family? Was it a chronic diagnosis? Was it an inheritance? etc. Particularly as we go through this massive wealth transfer, what does that look like? And um, can we identify, maybe get ahead of some of those factors? We also want to look at financial concerns. So are clients and prospective clients concerned about generational wealth issues? Are they concerned about relationship issues that could come as a result? Are they concerned about inflation uh, presidential elections, all of that sort of stuff. The market pulse, this was actually one of the comments that came in from Pilot One, curious about the market conditions at the time that the data was collected, which is a very valid point, particularly given how volatile the markets could get over the next several months or and years. So really wanting, wanting to capture what the markets were on that particular day that a person responded to the survey will be important as we move forward. In addition to the financial concerns, really honing in on more precise market concerns that a person might have as it relates to various sectors and political issues that are going on and, and of course, inflation there as well. And then over on the right side, it's some um, more of the outcome types of issues with health and not just looking at financial health, but looking at a person's physical health and using some of the common metrics that are used in other types of surveys to look at people's physical health, general health. We, we're really into physical health, it looks like. Sorry for that. Um, also really interested in a person's mental health, so not pathologizing pathologizing the respondents, but looking at are they engaging in things that are psychologically beneficial to them? Are they getting social interactions and so forth? And then we also want to look at if there's any sort of disability within the immediate family and following that over time as well. Of course, we know that's fairly prevalent across the U.S., so wanting to capture that as it's happening and seeing how that impacts some of these other elements of well-being and also just the inclination to seek out a financial professional or perhaps fire the financial professional. And then with that, I suspect you have questions or comments on that. We're going to open up some of these questions that are in the Q&A right now. But also, should we not be able to provide feedback at this exact moment in time? We do read all of these and we're able to capture those and include them in the next round of data collection. And as you ponder the presentation or if you're watching the recording of this, this QR code is live. We have a deadline of May 15th to provide feedback, but this link is always open on the client impact study landing page. And we'll take your feedback anytime you want to provide it. So with that, I think first I'll hand it over to Dr. Heckman and see what sort of questions we want to start off with. Or even, Kevin, if you want to manage that process, that would be great too. Yeah, uh, yeah. thank you very much. This, is, this has been a terrific presentation thus far. Uh, and thank you to, the, um, to uh, everyone who's been following along with this webinar today. A lot of great uh, conversation going on through the Q&A. One of the themes that I'm seeing among the questions is about what, what we view to be the uh, sample that we're going to be targeting over the next 10 years. Um, some questions about, are we going to be hitting high, high wealth uh, Americans? Are we going to be able to reach younger, uh, younger Americans who maybe are relatively early in their financial journey? Uh, uh, you want to talk very briefly about that, what, what, we're, what our broad strategy is? Anything? Sure, I can. Yeah, I can take a stab at that. And then anybody else feel free to hop in. Um, you know, I think we are trying to think about this as broadly as possible. One of the challenges, of course, is at the higher end of the wealth, um, from a sampling perspective, and to get reliable estimates, you do kind of need to oversample. And so we're, we'll definitely rely on um, our uh, partners at NORC to help on that side, kind of understanding what the right sampling scheme is in order to get reliable estimates of the things that we're interested in for that end of the distribution. But then by the same token, we are really curious to 
have a really wide um, breadth of participants, um, even on the lower income distribution. Um, and as I mentioned, that might typically be outside of a, uh, I don't know, a typical uh, CFP ideal client. Uh, because I think, at least my perspective, and I think a lot of us have the perspective that financial planning really has the potential to benefit uh, the public at large. And so we'd really like to understand a little bit more about what's going on in those income and asset <clears throat> levels that are typically outside of maybe uh, typical engagement. And so kind of along those lines, I saw a few questions about, you know, are we breaking down uh, particular differences by demographic characteristics or by um, generational cohorts and things like that. Absolutely, that will be part of, you know, the um, especially the first round of our formal data collection. At this point, we do have some of, we have every question kind of broken down in our uh, larger written report that will be published uh, related to the pilot data. But at this point, our sample size is basically too small to do really detailed breakdowns. And you might have noticed, like, we didn't break out uh, clients who work with a CFP professional versus clients that work with a financial uh, advisor who's not a CFP professional. We just really didn't have the sample size to do some of those sorts of comparisons. And that's true of some of the different demographic groups that we might like to compare as well. But going forward, that should certainly be part of what we're able to do. Perfect. When I'm looking through some of the uh, answered questions, just just so for some of the participants who maybe are not watching, who have who've not been reading Q and A, um, perhaps maybe give a little bit of clarity about both the the how we're defining a do it yourself household. Um, uh, Sony had a great answer there. Actually, uh, I don't know if you wanted to expand what you said there at all, um, but it's primarily. Oh, oh, go ahead, Sony. I'm sorry. Sorry, I had my mouse on the wrong screen there. So the do-it-yourself households were capturing by a no response to them not working with a financial professional. And we have this pretty good definition of a financial professional, I think, that we have been using throughout this whole process. And we've defined it as someone who provides financial products services and or advice. So we're capturing all sorts of different elements of the financial planning process, whether this be a one-time engagement, I bought something from you and I'm done, or maybe you created a financial plan with me and we review it less than annually. We're capturing all of that within the financial professional category, the clients who are working with the financial professional. But what we are capturing on the opposite end, the people who don't respond affirmative to affirmatively to that could be somebody who's working as um, they're buying products on their own, or maybe they're using an app on their own, but they're not engaged with another person as they do that process. Great. Yeah. Thank and I, you. I, I might add on to that because I saw a, a question about fee model and I, I think it'd be helpful just to revisit some of the so the question in the chat was related to, are you also capturing a uh, difference in basically business model and how the advisor is compensated? So we've, we've discussed that a lot and really where we landed, we felt like it was most important to understand the exact mix of services that are being provided, the depth at which those services are being provided, how frequently they're talking about different areas and who's responsible for implementing the action items within those areas. So we have three sets of questions that are really designed to capture and understand all the intricacies of the exact financial planning engagement. And we think that's relatively more important than the compensation model, because if we're capturing that well, um, we think that's a, we'll get to better comparison. So that also addresses um, the question about the DIY folks. So we'll be able to understand if somebody is engaging somebody for advice in one area versus many areas. And if they're implementing it or if somebody else is implementing it, and this is by the um, principal knowledge topic area. So we'll be able to tell the difference between retirement planning and investment planning, uh, who's responsible for what and at what level the uh, professional is engaging. And so that's kind of how we've approached that question and trying to get to comparison groups that matter. We're really trying to capture the differences in the services that are being provided. Thanks. 
Um, there are a couple of questions coming in here about how ultimately we would be measuring um, wellness, financial wellness of, of, of the consumer, of the client, um, including some some thoughts or suggestions of sources. Do you, you want to talk uh, briefly about uh, where we see the path for that is? Yes, would um, me, Dr. Leader, Dr. Kushal, would either of you like to address that? I was typing a question or a response in the chat. So if you repeat the question, I'll be happy to address it. Sure. I think the general question was around our, like how we're measuring financial wellness, how that corresponds. I think some of the questions were to the CFPB uh, financial wellness um, scale. Um, and so if you just want to talk a little bit about how we're measuring that, I think that'd be helpful. Yeah. Thanks, Kurt, for asking the question and others that are bringing that in. That's the question that I was typing your response to. So this will be more efficient. Maybe if you could just flip back to the framework slide, I think that would be helpful as a reminder for folks that we're modeling this off of the a cognitive behavioral perspective and really wanting to capture more than just is a person healthy. And I put that in quotes, healthy. Um, there are lots of really good ratios that we can use and are using. There are some really good elements of how a person feels about their financial situation from the CFPB measure. Um, one thing that we have expanded, though, is the psychological and social condition, which is trying to capture like family socialization and also some of these um, almost financial beliefs that a person has or their feelings of self-control and stress and anxiety. And we're not looking at any one of these single things in isolation. We, if you were at the CFP board art conference last fall, we did show you a really brief outline of a scoring mechanism that captures each of the, these three areas because we can't just look at a person's objective status and think that this creates financial wellness for them because how a person thinks about that situation or, or how a person acts upon that information is going to be different even if a, a household looks exactly the same from a resource management perspective. So hopefully that addresses your question. I think it might be helpful to also look once we post the um, our report online and look at some of those variables that we're using to capture the psychosocial condition, which is really quite unique. And then also looking at that, uh, the feelings or the financial well-being element as well. I'll just add to very quickly that, um, so we did a, a paper that's out on the CFP board's website under the client impact uh, page that goes through the different uh, resources that we referenced. And just because we see it quite a bit coming up in the Q&A of the CFPB uh, wellness uh, score, that or the scale rather, that we did reference that. We of course referenced other works inside of financial wellness uh, as well as general wellness, um, which has been spoken about. So if you wanna just kind of understand some of those resources that we use, CFPB included, that paper is out there and available just as a, a quick reference point as well. Perfect. Um... Another question that, that's coming through that's I, I saw that's, that strikes me as kind of interesting is the role of the the, uh, the, the clients probably as, as basically being factored by their age or perhaps by their generation, what they've actually experienced up to the point before they even enter the survey panel. So a baby boomer, a Gen Xer have experienced, you know, may have enjoyed the, the booms of the 90s, but, 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 um, but also, you know, whereas millennials might have been entering you know, basically, being in their financial journey during during the two, during the aughts when 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 things were kind of uh, rough. How are we gonna? Um, and maybe perhaps it's more about reporting and how we factor. It. Any thoughts about that sort of that observation that someone made in the comments about that? I'll start just yeah. to. Go oh, ahead. sorry. I'll no, start just it. from using the framework, um, pointing towards something that Dr. Luter was talking about. So when we look at the um, that framework and specifically inside of that social condition, socialization is going to be a key player in this because it's 
when we think about where we're at in this perception of where we're at and when we make that assessment, we're thinking about our past experiences, we're essentially involving where we're at currently today, but we're also looking at, gosh, I, this is where I'd like to be in the future as well. So just to, uh, before we get into kind of more of the technical pieces, and I'll throw it over to Dr. Heckman for that, but if we look at the framework to understand that we are capturing some of that in the socialization and the social conditions, saying that we, we acknowledge um, that that is coming through in the way that people are reporting and perceive their financial realities. Yeah, that's great. I was going to say something similar. Um, and then I think we'll be able to account for those sort of generational differences um, on the back end as we go through some of our analyses. But I think a lot of what might be important about, you know, those generational perspectives might be captured in some of these other items that we have in the survey. We have an interesting comment uh, and question that comes along with um, the broader goals of the of this project. And um, I'll just kind of read it verbatim. Besides hoping to prove the value of CFP, is see if people are also interested in learning about what aspects of financial advice are most important to clients so that we can better train financial professionals. And I, I'll just start off and then kind of ask, ask the researchers for a thought or two about this. This is actually a primary goal of, of this project. Uh, there are 100,000 CFP professionals or hundreds of thousands of financial advisors out there. We, we see tens of millions of households that, that, that rely on services, a variety of services from financial advisors to help them with their financial journey. We know there's value there, but what is that value? What actually makes for a successful relationship? Why, why, are, why are households willing to make the investments in both in time and resources and, you know, of course, money, fees, to, 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 to seek out these services for a better financial outcome? So what is actually driving that success? And driving that value is something that we can go back and, and better inform both, you know, from the CFP certification itself, but I think more broadly in, in training future advisors, train, train, training future financial advisors. I think that is one actually one of our key goals here. What actually is driving success here? So mm -hmm. uh, Mike, do you have any Michael, do you have any thoughts? I think we we're we're still, again, this is still the exploratory phase, but I think these are the important questions that we have to start trying to grapple with and to try to, you know, see, see seeing the same clients over time is going to give us the ability to see trajectories and to see what what kind of inflection, inflection points might occur, whether that's an engagement with an advisor or a life event or the combination of those two things. So um, we're going to we're going to be able to explore these things, um, you know, over time in a way that hasn't been done before. Um, and I think that's going to give us a lot of information, both about the experiences of individuals as well as their advisors. And, um, you know, we're going to see a lot of matching, too, where clients are seeking out certain kinds of advisors with certain kinds of attributes because they do cer certain things well. And that may not be entirely around, you know, saving for retirement. It might be other kinds of things they bring to the table. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good thought. And I was thinking along similar lines that. One of the great aspects of the 10-year the longitudinal nature of this is being able to understand characteristics before um, an engagement, during an engagement, after an engagement, those trajectories like Dr. Collins was mentioning. We are at the top of the hour, and I appreciate the, uh, the, the a lot of the engagement in this conversation. We're going to put the QR code back up, um, and we'd love to continue to hear your feedback, your questions, uh, your suggestions uh, throughout. So if you haven't already, this QR code will take you to a landing page on the CFP board website. And at the very bottom towards that page, there's a place where uh, we, we welcome your comments. Uh, every comment you share, every comment that's been shared today is something that we'll be taking a close look and there have been some great ideas popping up. Otherwise, I want to thank, thank all the researchers for their time, both today for, this, for delivering this webinar, but frankly, the work they've been doing over the past year plus uh, on this project. We're really excited about the progress that we've made, and this is going to be a very, a very, very uh, exciting uh, year for this project, and we will we'll have more of the report down the road. So have a great day. Thank you very much.